You say to people, Fugu Zenzele, do things for yourself. That's what they've done. It they've occupied the land. If you break the law, uh, where things are supposed to be done legally, that is wrong. It is actually wrong to say that South African citizens are breaking the law. It's in the Constitution, Petrus. It's in this the land Constitution. was stolen from us. And the apartheid government, they write the laws, they write laws to move the land away from the indigenous people. They give the, our land to the people that come from Europe. Only death will stop us. And it's not like we're going into this thing without knowing uh, the consequences. We don't want to go the Zimbabwean way. He's basically threatening white farmers that if they do not voluntarily hand over their land to black people, then there would be a violent takeover. We are going to come to a point where we become like Zimbabwe. People are going to start to take the, the land by force. We are not calling for the slaughtering of white people, at least for now. I'm G.A. Sola. Hello. In this fourth installment in this series of Racism in South Africa, I will discuss one of the most contentious and important issues that South Africa is currently facing, the land issue. I consider it so important because it is the only aspect in this series that has led and is leading to actual physical violence and conflict throughout the country. I've understood from my research that this topic is so vast and complicated that I will not be able to completely cover every detail, so I've simplified everything in the interest of time. In 1913, the Native Land Act was passed under Apartheid South Africa, prohibiting the buying and selling of land, the practice of sharecropping and serfdom, and the use of any white-owned land by blacks. This perhaps would not have been such a great problem if whites did not own 90% of the South African Union at the time, because it prevented blacks from ever owning their own land in the better parts of the country for whatever reason, be it agriculture, housing, or anything else. So naturally, farm workers could only live by working for white farmers for wages. On the farms, which provide white families with their cheap food, a black farm worker receives perhaps $300 a year. He can never own the land he works. Blacks were forcefully relocated into these neglected and poorly managed townships, or Bantu stands, where a number of crimes committed by white law enforcement officials took place. Some of these were dealt with during the TRC. In 1994, the ANC was voted into office, and from 1995, plans and promises were made for the redistribution of land. A goal of redistributing 30% of South Africa's land by 2014 was set. And most people, both black and white, do agree that the injustices of the past had to be corrected. But the ANC did not realize the reality of the importance of land to the economy and the great influence that it holds. As it stands now in 2021, according to the land audit reports of 2017, whites still own 72% of land, coloreds own 15%, Indians own 5 and blacks own 4. Though I should note that government statistics have been contested. So less than 10% of the land has been redistributed. But that is not actually the real problem. The far greater problem is what happens to both the redistributed land as well as those who obtain the redistributed land. A survey by the Commission in Limpopo, KwaZulu-Natal and the Eastern Cape show that there is little to no agricultural activity after the land has been redistributed. So farm workers simply go to old commercial farms that have been established for a long time because at least there they will receive payments because they need to eat. However, there are reasons for this low productivity and this is where things become quite complicated. After acquiring land, these land reform beneficiaries argue that they receive little to no financial or educational support from the government. What's more, most of these people do not obtain title deeds from the government, which makes their land theirs only by ideal, or perhaps practice. But if the land is ever contested by private companies, other landowners, or more especially tribal chiefs, particularly in KZN, then the landowner has nothing to show for it as proof. And now the reason they do not obtain title deeds seems to be more due to state interests. The two greatest interests I've discovered so far are that firstly the government wishes to keep ownership of the land to themselves in order to keep people under lease agreements. This will allow them to continue earning a percentage from those working the land, which can be large corporations or small-scale farmers. Since about 2006, we've had a proactive land acquisition strategy where the state is now buying the land itself. And this, I think, is very important because uh, this uh, example has shown us that when the state is the owner, it is not always going to act in the, in the best interests of the poor. In this case, the state as a landlord is protecting its own property rights against people who would like to use that land. So now we see the state buying whole commercial farms and making them available on lease to black commercial farmers. This should not be too much of a surprise. 
Remember that the ANC holds socialistic ideas and heavily engages itself in the affairs of the private sector, for reasons that they may portray as humanistic, such as BE, but it really seems more a means to earn more and more each year from taxes. The second state interest is to avoid antagonizing certain entities that either play a large part in the economy or that the government simply cannot quite control, even if they wanted to. For the latter, I'm specifically referring to tribal chiefs, particularly in KZN under the Ingo Nyama Trust. These lands have been in their ownership since apartheid days, and the government is fully aware that these owners will not willingly surrender their land or have any government intervention that disrupts their workings. The 13% that is under the leaders of our people, the traditional leaders, we are not going to touch that land. I should however emphasize that these tribal owners are all black, and so no one really cares if blacks own more than 3 million hectares of land. However, there is an issue with Afrikaners owning that much land, for reasons I'll discuss in a moment. The former reason is because of the impact that complete redistribution of land would have on the economy. Bear in mind that South Africa is among the leading producers of a number of important crops, fruits and vegetation, and more importantly, internal food security must also be maintained. So to put it simply, there are government, corporate, traditional, national and even cartel interests at play in why land reform is so slow. And based on the available data that we can access, it's sometimes difficult to determine which of these has the most influence. But overall it comes down to money and sustenance. Even though people would like to think that it has something to do with injustice of the past, the world and the world economy are very different from how they were in 1913, as well as the country's increasing population. So how does this all relate to racism? Things get a lot more complicated from this point, so I will simplify it as much as possible. On one side, the rhetoric from the black pro-land reform movement regarding the land issue bases itself on cultural, legal, historical and humanitarian motivations as to why land expropriation should be executed without compensation immediately. Because their philosophy is built on the idea that land was stolen forcefully through conquest or unfairly through the Natives Land Act. Of course, this is mixing two different parts of history, but both are indeed true to an extent. And so in their perspective, it is absurd to have to pay or even ask for what they believe rightfully belongs to them on a historical and traditional basis. The idea that we must buy our land, we didn't buy. This man says we must buy our land, stolen land. This we shall not do. There is no reason to buy back our stolen land. The white landowners, however, are not willing to give up what they consider to be their land and also basing their reasons on culture and history. And we're not going to go away. And we're the rightful owners of this land. <laughs> so. Afrikaners believe that they own the lands that they own today because they fought for against the British during the wars. But bear in mind they also fought against the indigenous people who were present before any European arrived. They also believe this because some acquired the land through transactions from blacks and whites. But black people today consider these transactions invalid because they took place under unfair circumstances that were in favor of whites and against blacks. And so they also hold an emotional and cultural attachment to the land as they've owned it for generations. Many of them do agree that the land act was completely unfair, but do not agree with the notion that they should hold any accountability to that today and give up their land because of what happened in the past. So we have a tight situation in which both sides consider themselves rightful owners of the land they occupy, but the difference is that whites still own more land and usually the better lands than blacks do. The interesting thing, however, about basing land ownership according to historicity is that it causes a problem. As the Khoisan people, who are currently a minority in South Africa, should then be declared the rightful owners of South Africa. Where does the land come from? From the great spirit creator? Yeah, I don't think anyone will be giving the country to them anytime soon. However, it is interesting, because for the sake of consistency, if we are to bring up colonial history, then we would also have to bring up Bantu expansion history. But to the blacks, that goes too far back. Just as to the whites, the Natives Land Act goes too far back. But the current reality is that neither the Khoi or the whites are in power at the moment, Instead, the Bantu blacks are in power. So if we put history aside, then we're left with the present situation. And the present situation is that whites own most of South Africa's land. Now, these white-owned lands and farms are the most profitable for the economy and country. However, and this is the important part, these lands tend to only be more profitable than the other farms, which are mostly black-owned, because the government and banks only support those whom they see qualified through collateral. And the collateral that banks require in this instance is land tenure. As I've mentioned, most of the land reform beneficiaries don't even hold title deeds. And already established companies that the government and banks do support are also a problem for them because they will do whatever is necessary to quell or eliminate the competition. Because remember that under a capitalistic system, farming is still a business. And the more competitors there are, the harder it is to make a profit. 
And so some of the already established agricultural corporate giants act as gatekeepers and cartels. These corporations and individuals have so much power that they've managed to form a system in which those who wish to enter the market must seek their approval. And obviously, being their competitors, they'll be very reluctant to allow them to enter. They have a company, but guess what happened? The people who are supposed to do due diligence yeah. is the IDC which owns force cost 60%. So I have to take my, my application to be reviewed by, for, by, by IDC who are also FOSCO, who are my rivals. This is why some groups such as the EFF see capitalism as the enemy and communism as the solution. But that's a debate for another time. And so the situation creates a vicious cycle in which those with much receive more and those with little receive little to no help. This does not necessarily condemn them to failure immediately, but in the long run it is not sustainable. It is however also not accurate to see the banks and the government as evil for not supporting certain people. The reality is that if banks do not get returns from their loans, they will fall. And our biggest concern is that should we have expropriation without compensation or even at reduced compensation, that our banking system will fail. There will be no more private funding for the development of agriculture as a wealth creator. People assume that banks have an obligation to help everyone, but that is an erroneous notion because they can only assist those who can provide some form of assurance to produce a profit in the future. So in reality, the entire system is a paradox, because those who need help can only get help if they can help themselves. And many of the relatively new black farmers certainly cannot help themselves, and so there's no certainty for the banks or the government that they'll do well in the future. Now the news that people really do not want to hear now is that if land expropriation of any kind occurs immediately, the assurance that the banks currently hold that a land will retain its value in the future, or in other words, produce a profit, will disappear completely. Because there's no telling what will become of that land under new management and new owners, using it for perhaps new purposes. This is really not good news for farmers, particularly in places like the Western Cape, because no matter how hard they try to keep up the land value and produce a profit, if they do not meet the requirements set up by their leadership, the same people who gave them that land will take that land back from them and give them to someone who can produce a profit, who may very well be the same person who had it before them. If maybe they give me 10 hectares now for me to expand for my animals, and I fail because I don't have money, I make a borehole. Number one, how much is a borehole? Sure. They, I don't have any, any sponsors. When you go to, 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 buy to land bank, they put red tapes. Yeah. At the end of the day, whatever you have done if within six months, They'll come and monitor you on that farm. They want bank statement. They want what? Put it in what front did, of your mouth. What did you do? And if you didn't manage to make money, the DA is taking that farm away. You won't get anything. The reality is that the land reform beneficiaries are not currently fully prepared to take over the land in the first place. Farming to feed a community of about 200 people is not the same thing as feeding a country of 55 million people. And it is impossible for them to do this without loans and support. And the reason we have those things is to in fact ensure that once people get onto the land, they receive the support they deserve because they are not going to be able to sustain those things without support. Nowhere in the world have we seen successful transformation of smallholder agriculture to profitable agriculture without longer term financing that of what is available in the market at lower rates than what is available in the market. And so yes, it would indeed be a catastrophe to redistribute all land immediately if there is no fully detailed plan on how the land will be used, for what purposes, how far the borders of each property extends, the relationship between traditional leaders and the new landowners, measures to prevent or correct mismanagement of resources, the circumstances and restrictions for unauthorized people to access land resources, and most importantly, how will the currently state-owned land be managed if all the land belongs to the people? Now there are some governments and private organizations that specialize in educating new farmers, but this is simply put not enough. The agricultural sector remains underfunded, despite last week's announcement of an increase in agricultural funding. So some people seeking a middle ground argue that there can simply be a contribution from both sides. Blacks can own the land, but then it must be used in an efficient manner to not cause a national disaster such as the one in Zimbabwe. But this middle ground tends to anger both sides, because the whites argue that it would be theft to take the land that they believe rightfully belongs to them, even though the constitution does allow expropriation of land for certain purposes. This expropriation bill existed since 1975. If you take land from the white people and you give it to the black people, that's a racist act. Blacks are also upset with this middle ground as they argue that they should not be forced to follow instructions on what to do with what they believe to be their land. 
even if it compromises their own food security. And then you have the Khoisan who keep reminding everybody that they were here first, and argue that they are being marginalized and ignored in the debate, and believe that they should be the rightful owners of this land. Who should own this land right now in South Africa? Nobody but the Great Spirit Creator. Or at least something like that. Even during Mandela's administration, black people foresaw the reality that complete land distribution was only a dream, and that few, if not none of them, would see a significant land reform in their own lifetime. And so some resorted to the only means they know best, violence. I've watched Lauren Southern's 2018 documentary, Farmlands, and besides the funny butchering of names in the film, the Khoisan people, the trek boar, the vor trekkers, the Afrikaner band to boar, Tabo Mokwena, to Aranya, the majority of it was a fair description of the reality of farm attacks. But since it did not deal with the black perspective, it may lead one to believe that farm attacks are part of a greater conspiracy to annihilate the South African white population. In reality, farm attacks from what we can observe are motivated by the frustration of slow steps to land reform by radically criminally minded violent individuals who are attempting to drive farmers out of their homes and take their land by force. This is why very often in these horrific murder cases, little to nothing is stolen because it is part of what they call nkataza, a tactic that these criminals use to wear a person down until they eventually surrender their land. Now I should note that white landowners and farmers are not always completely innocent. There are cases of exploitation of workers or aborted disputes or even assaults on workers or livestock by white people. But in terms of farm attacks where landowners are being driven out by force, whites refuse to go down without a fight and so they defend themselves. And indeed, farm attacks do happen on a very frequent basis. But unlike what certain bias sources claim, they are firstly not always killed, and they are not always racially motivated, as black people are also attacked on farms. These attacks are first and foremost regarding land, because if they can seize one farmer's land by force, then it paves the way for a domino effect to happen, whereby his neighbor's land is seized and so on and so forth. But it is true that the fact that these landowners are white plays a role, as people feel no sympathy for them because they believe that the land was stolen from the blacks by whites, which is only true to an extent. Now all this fighting, protests, riots and violence may give the impression that the country is on the verge of civil war. It will certainly take a lot more than people fighting on farms for that to happen, considering that many people neither care or have even heard of farm attacks. Also remember that South Africa contains some regions that are among the most dangerous in the world. The South African police service is also known for corruption. Certain pro-minority groups such as AfriForum accuse the ANC of either being complicit or willfully ignorant of these farm attacks. This is why some people get the impression that farm attacks are special cases. But the big picture of crime in South Africa proves otherwise. People all over the country, particularly black people, also experience terrible injustices that are overlooked by the police service and the government. Perhaps the only valid reason that farm attacks should be treated differently is because farms are usually difficult to reach speedily, and so law enforcement usually arrives too late. But otherwise, these crimes are no different from many other crimes in the country, and are not based on race. So in the end, you have one side that's angry with the government because they have not kept their promises, and the other side is angry because the government has racist tendencies toward them, resulting in people taking matters into their own hands, and conflict occurs. And the government in the middle sits and does little to nothing. And lastly, I should answer the question of why people think that land is such a big deal when most people in South Africa live in urban or rural areas with nothing to do with the land issues. This mostly has to do with those who actually work the land. Farm workers are among the poorest people in the country while working for the richest people in the country. And yes, that is a fact. Some farmers are literally millionaires. However, the aspiration of a farm worker is to one day have their own, perhaps small piece of land to produce their own vegetation and start their own business. Farm work is very labor intensive. So imagine working from morning till dusk for a very low amount of money. Now before becoming upset with the farmers, Bear in mind that the only reason farm workers even have jobs is because the farmer can make a profit from his produce. When the farmer's earnings decrease, the wages of the farm workers decrease. Because, and this is important, you cannot farm commercially without making a profit. This is basic economics. You can't pay for tons of water without a profit. You cannot pay for millions of rands worth of machinery without a profit. 
You cannot pay for thousands of liters of petrol without making a profit. So if the farmer goes down, everyone under him goes down, and ultimately the economy and the country along with them. This is why people tend to remind each other of Zimbabwe's situation when discussing the land issue to not repeat the same mistakes. And uh, I just don't care what they say, as long as I know I'm right. So they can say anything in their papers, uh, damage me in every way possible, as long as the people I lead are behind me and approve of what we are doing. That's what matters. The rest of the world will one day, you see, be uh, uh, persuaded to believe we were right. In conclusion, regardless of ideologies and rhetoric, People are already fighting, rioting, murdering, burning, and preparing themselves for worse things. This is why whichever stand one may have on the issue, the discussion must be taken seriously. However, I personally have a feeling that this issue will be addressed somehow through the next elections, because whichever party is elected will determine whether the problems will worsen or lessen. But the situation will undoubtedly not remain stagnant. Things will either get better or worse. I'm G.A. Soda. Goodbye. But also we know that the implementation support for people getting land has been of such poor quality that it's actually undermined the argument in favour of land reform. And critics of the process have been quick to point out that therefore any further land reform is at a cost to the country as a whole. And I think that this is deeply problematic. The government knows, it has done its own research, it knows what the problems are. These are remediable problems. There are examples of things working well, but land reform is never going to work by itself. And the question that I think we need to come back to is politically, why do we allow continued failure on this issue?